Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran trying to get a lost session off a water-damaged tape reel, or else a scrappy upstart trying to get a lost session out of a Dropbox account that you forgot the password for, this is your show, because ultimately it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the first Friday of April 2021, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Didier, who drove an Acura Integra with racing stripes and who is always trying to talk to you about French deconstructionist literature and sell you methamphetamines. And old Didier would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. But it's the future now, you guys, and that's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All you need for a professional website is already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free, mailing list tools, and social media integrations. It's a wonderful product. Listeners of the Working Songwriter podcast can go to banzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Use the promo code TWS to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Uh, If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm over on my YouTube channel for Sunday Songs. That's a live stream. I'm live every Sunday night playing tunes, taking questions in the live chat, taking requests in the live chat. It's a really fun, really interactive experience. I dare to say that we've been building something of a community over there on Sunday nights, including many people who are listeners to this podcast. So come on over and be a part of it. Every Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, head over to YouTube and search for Joe Pug, or go to joepugmusic.com and just click on the live stream tab. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You search for The Working Songwriter, or you search for my name. And then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for this show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription. A subscription that you don't have to make, but that you choose to make because uh, you dig this show and you won't miss a couple bucks at the end of the month. Uh, If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thanks to everybody who's done that already. Uh, And if you're not in a place to contribute that way, I totally understand. You could still help us by leaving us a rating in the iTunes store or uh, just telling a friend about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. I'll end all the harassment there. This week's episode is a little bit inside baseball. It has to do with the inner workings of a new technology that might revolutionize music ownership. So it might just be of interest to hardcore songwriters or music business people in our audience. I've always liked to think of this show as the water cooler that songwriters gather around during breaks from work. Uh, And if that's the case, then this is definitely a subject that would come up. Um, Then again, uh, Web 3.0 is going to have major significance for almost every business. So maybe this could still be a useful primer for you, regardless of your line of work. Um, I hope you enjoy our chat. (music) 
When we were first introduced to the internet, it was basically a digital equivalent of a broadside newspaper. It was Web 1.0, otherwise known as the static web. The web we have now is known as Web 2.0, or the social web. Advancements in coding allowed for interactive websites like Facebook, Wikipedia, YouTube. This is when user-generated content was allowed to flourish. What we now stand on the cusp of is Web 3.0, also known as the Semantic Web, a new system that will seamlessly integrate human input with AI and machine learning. Of particular interest to us as artists in this new system will be the ubiquity of blockchain technology. Blockchain is a digital ledger of transactions that is duplicated and distributed across an entire network of computer systems, making it very difficult to change, hack, or cheat. Blockchain, then, makes it possible to determine the provenance of a computer file. That is, the ability to authenticate the original digital copy of a work of art. Imagine the value of the original digital copy of Radiohead's In Rainbows, or Bonnie Vare's For Emma Forever Ago. If those artists had minted original digital copies of those seminal works, their value would have tracked closer to a priceless Basquiat painting than a thin dime Spotify stream. And because of the digital blockchain, it's now possible for artists to retain a percentage of that work's digital sale price in perpetuity. Basically, when something goes viral in Web 3.0, it will now profit the artist, not just the platform. And that's not the only ramification of blockchain for digital music. It will also likely revolutionize publishing splits, streaming platforms, and fundamentally, the artist-listener relationship. Our guest this week is Matthew Chaim, a musician and author who has gone down the Web 3.0 and NFT rabbit hole and who is quite gifted at explaining these complex ideas lucidly. I caught up on the phone with him this week to talk about what he's learned. Matthew Chaim, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter podcast. You're here today to talk about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, uh, which are taking the music industry by storm. But uh, you presumably you wouldn't be interested in these at all if you weren't a songwriter and musician yourself. So I was hoping we could start out by you giving our, our listeners kind of an idea of your background in music and, and how you got your start. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Joe. Uh, excited to chat with you about this stuff. Um, yeah. So I grew up in Montreal and uh, I started making music here with friends kind of in my late teens. Um, I actually started out rapping back in the day and I had a bit of like a YouTube kind of show with a, a friend of mine where we would write raps and kind of cut up a funny episode of laughter and, and, and music and that's sort of how it got started. And we, we kept making music together for a while. Um, and through that show, I started just getting the inkling to sing more and, and write songs rather than just lyrics. I was sort of into being like a punchline kind of, you know, class clown type of, type of uh, teenager. But then the actual kind of, um, yeah, the songwriting started to, to seep its way in and also kind of the, the clever lines melted away and started bringing in some more intimate, you know, more kind of heart, like heartful stuff. And I started to notice the therapeutic aspects of songwriting rather than just the ones to kind of be clever and funny, if you will. Um, and then that, that sort of, that, that sort of love just started to swallow me whole. Um, and from that, I, I started making music on my own, working with producers in Montreal. Um, and I released my first EP called Homemade off of that off of those collaborations with producers here. And then I moved to LA for about two or so years recently coming back at the beginning of COVID and now kind of uh, back in Montreal. But I, I, I uh, ended up driving to LA, had some connections there, started making friends with some people I was working with out there. And then um, through those collaborations released uh, my second project called the Mathematics of Nature an album that was uh, primarily, well, 
all of it was produced by a co-writer and producer who goes by rabbit. Um, and so those were kind of like the, yeah, the impetus of my, my first two projects. Now I'm, uh, in the middle of releasing my third and, uh, this, uh, <laughs> and at the same time while being back, uh, in Montreal, I started falling down the crypto or NFT rabbit hole. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, and it seems to be quite um, a rabbit hole. It's one of those rabbit holes that's starting to poke its head into po popular <laughs> culture now. Like people are just starting to hear this term NFT. Um, so could we start by you just telling us what a non-fungible token is technically? Yeah. So uh, a non-fungible token, it, it's funny. I, I commented this in my first post that it, it, the name is kind of misleading or it's a, it's a complex name. Uh, it's kind of negating something else. So it's a non-fungible token is not a fungible token. And what a fungible, and so it's worth knowing what a fungible token is or what fungibility is. Um, a fungible token is basically like the US dollar or the Canadian dollar in our traditional sense, where if I have a US dollar and you have a US dollar and we trade those US dollars, nothing has really changed. We both have the exact same, we've, we've two maybe different pieces of a paper for trading bills, but the actual value of those things are exactly the same. So that's fungibility. Um, so therefore, non-fungibility is really anything else, a car, a house, anything that we can, you know, subs uh, uh, subscribe or ascribe value to um, would be considered a non-fungible asset, right? Because those things have different value. So a non-fungible token, or a, sorry, a non-fungible asset is any asset that we would ascribe a, a different level of value to. So then bringing that into tokens, um, you know, and bringing that into crypto land. So a fungible token is like Bitcoin. So similar to our US dollar, exact same value. If I have a Bitcoin and we trade Bitcoins, we have the exact same value built. That's, that's a fungible token in, in the crypto world. A non-fungible token is basically anything that can be, have ascribed to it a unique, um, level of value or a unique asset inside of this basically crypto world where things are living as um, tokens or, 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 or proof of, of, of authenticity on this distributed ledger called a blockchain. So as you can see, it like quickly fumbles into these kind of complex territories, but um, that's sort of the basics of what a non-fungible token at, a, at its base level is. So basically, the difference would be if I had a U.S. dollar and you had a U.S. dollar, you and I could trade those and effectively still have the same thing uh, as the other one had. Whereas if I had a Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, rookie card and you had a Ken Griffey Jr. you know, 10 years into his career card and we traded those, we would have both of us would have markedly different things. Exactly. And it could even be as, you know, as, as mundane as if I have a chair and you have a, have a table and we trade those things, we, we've just traded two different values. And then going as subtle to, you know, the, the, the rookie card example that you just gave, if we had the same, if we both had LeBron James rookie cards of the same, you know, year and everything, um, but my addition is addition two and your addition is addition 300, while the subtlety of the difference in those values is quite subtle. They're still different. They're not, they're non-fungible. Got it. And can you explain to people who aren't too crypto savvy what the blockchain is, which is the technology that undergirds the ability to, to make things unique? Yeah. So the, yes. So the, the blockchain is essentially, it's just a, like you could think of it as just like a database or a ledger or just, or even the way I like to look at it is like literally a piece of paper, Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is very kind of like simplifying it, but like a piece of paper where we write down who has what, or, you know, so let's say me and you, you know, I have um, $10 and you have $10 and we have this piece of paper and we say, okay, I have $10 and Joe has $10 and we both sign that piece of paper type thing. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's like a ledger. It's a database that we're saying, this is, this is the state of our inventory, call it. Right now, in, in, our, in our traditional world, we kind of use databases to secure many different things, including money, and we use, like, banks for that, basically. We trust these banks to say, okay, I, have, I deposit $1,000, and on their 
database or system, whether it's online or in the bank, that $1,000 is now, quote unquote, in my account. What the blockchain does is it actually decentralizes that whole system. So instead of having to trust me or you or some, cent- uh, some centralized third party like a bank, we can now all hold, or many, many people and many, many computers in the world, all hold the same, quote unquote, pieces of paper. A piece of paper, it's servers on, on a computer, but we're all holding the same state of the world. We're, we could, so it's basically like saying thousands of different computers owned by thousands of different people all over the world would have the same sort of ledger that says Joe has $10 and I have $10. And because we can all validate that to be true, we can have a decentralized system that allocates or is able to, we're able to trust that this is the current state of the world and where everything is. So that allows the fungible and non-fungible tokens inside of that decentralized world to be trusted and, and, and matter. So that base to take it back to this analogy, that, that would basically make it blockchain basically makes it impossible for someone to show up with a, a counterfeit Ken Griffey Jr. rookie card, basically. <clears throat> yeah. You you basically would need, you know, this also like starts to get into the technicalities that are, you know, above my pay grade. Sure. But basically, you know, in order to actually um, trick the system, you would basically have to trick over like the majority of these distributed, uh, you know, nodes or, or operators all over the world. Mm-hmm. And that's just like, it just reaches levels of it's, it's, it's the cost of doing that is like unfeasible for any uh, person or even nation state on planet earth to be able to do that. So it's just like next to impossible. It limits impossibility of, um, like you say, forging some sort of, thing and, and, and shoving it into those distributed ledgers. Gotcha. So this talk so far would, uh, it seems to me, I think most listeners of this program are probably thinking, great, this is awesome if I want to start like a crypto startup, but I'm a songwriter. What the hell does this have to do with me? And and, and that is the question. Yeah. Why is this all of a sudden starting to pop up in entertainment channels? Totally. So great question. Um, and this is the exact road that I took in getting into this stuff was it was a friend who works in decentralized finance. So it's really like the, you know, the cryptocurrency side of things, the finance side of things who got me into this world. And he started telling me about digital art that's being traded online. And it, it just like flipped my head around. Like I didn't understand what that meant or why people um, are doing that. Um, but as I started to dig deeper, I realized how much this stuff does touch the art world and the entertainment world and content creators in general and how it can really empower them. Um, the reason being that for the most part, you know, let's look at musicians, especially we exist at a time where digital content is the way that most things are consumed. However, we are unable to trace digital content in any sort of scarce way. I read a song I created in Ableton. I print it out and I put it up onto the internet. Now anyone in the world can copy that song, put it on, you know, download it or whatever, or, or whatever by, by white hat means or, or black hat means, whether you, you could actually do that. And it, it essentially reaches like a limit of zero value because if everyone can copy it, everyone can own it. So no one owns it. Right. But now we're kind of moving towards a system where we, where we can carve value around the original file come to think of it like so the same way that in the physical world in the past you would let's say cut a vinyl and that first pressing has a lot of value right Right. i mean if that song blows up that first original pressing has story narrative around it wow that was the first pressing before they copied it into thousands and tens of tens tens of thousands of copies Mm -hmm. up until now that original quote-unquote file on the digital landscape is just lost in the ether. We don't, there is no original file anymore. It's right. just, it's just, they're all the exact same thing, but by creating non fungible tokens around them and, and stamping those as the, the, the original file and plugging that into the, the trusted, you know, like the thing that we can trust as like the, the, the state of the world, which is the blockchain, we can say, this is the original file. And then we could even say, this is file. This is, you know, quote unquote, like the vinyl pressing one, two, three, four, up, up to a million and up to infinity. And all of those things have 
history and transactions that we can verify publicly. So we can all agree on what is the original pressing in a digital world. So that suddenly brings up all new ideas of how we can use that to create value or rather to, um, to, to reorient the value that it has been, but has kind of been lost in the first, call it 20 years of living in a digital world. Gotcha. So basically artists can take um, a, let's say the digital master of their album, and they can basically encode into the metadata of that, uh, that like AIF file or that MP3, they can encode into it basically a serial number saying this is serial number one, this is copy number two, number three, number four, like that. Is that the idea? It's it, sort of, it, it, it's, I guess it's a little bit the other way around in the sense that you would basically create a token that's kind of like a digital file that lives on the blockchain and it points to the original file. So it wouldn't be necessarily, you see, sorry. You're fine. She's, she's getting really excited about all this NFT talk, man. Yeah, exactly. Come here, love. Um, We just moved to a first floor apartment, so she still gets used to the door opening. Ah, oh, gotcha. On the lobby floor. You good? You chill? Um, sorry, where were we? Uh, so I was saying, um, you were starting to speak to, I said, basically, I was asking if you could encode the fact that it was the first pressing into the metadata of like an AIF or an MP3 file, and you were saying it didn't work exactly like that, kind of worked backwards. Yeah, so it's more like you had this thing called a non-fungible token. So you would have kind of this proof of authenticity that actually lives on the blockchain. And in that digital file, there would be metadata about that song and pointing to the original, let's say, WAV file or MP3, like you say. So when you go to mint the NFT, you're not actually putting metadata into the file of the MP3, but you're actually putting the MP3's location and uh, file content into the med- metadata of the um, the token or the digital file that's actually going to live on the blockchain's ledger. Gotcha. So at that point, I'm an artist. I have this non-fungible token that's on the blockchain. It points to this original wave file or whatever it is. Um, now I have it. Now how do I um, distribute it. Say I wanted to have an auction for this. Tell my fans, hey, here's a new song. You can own the original copy of this. We're going to have an auction. On what platform are they able to to grab that? Obviously, they can't do it through Spotify, probably couldn't do it through Bandcamp or something like that. How are they actually right. bidding on and then taking possession of that token? Yeah, good question. So these are like kind of NFT platforms or marketplaces that are popping up kind of every day, but there are a few, uh, I would say maybe a dozen that are the most popular um, platforms to do this. And these are places where you can both mint the NFT, meaning create it, and then also sell it or auction it off. Some of the most popular sites are called OpenSea, uh, Zora, um, Foundation, Super Rare, and the list goes on. Some of them are public and permissionless, meaning you don't need to be invited to create on them. And others are more kind of curated and invite only. So OpenSea is a good example of kind of one of like the biggest marketplace for this stuff. And you can, anyone can go on there and create an NFT and auction it off. Mm -hmm. So that's a good place to start. But when it comes to this, to these marketplaces where this stuff has really blown up, you know, even before 2021 has really been in the visual art world. Mm -hmm. The audio world is kind of just starting to get its legs and, and these platforms are, are just, just getting started. And and you mentioned Bandcamp. There's a, a, a platform that has just opened its doors. It's really in beta and only started a few weeks ago called catalog, uh, catalog catalog.works. And they are, their intent is to be kind of a band camp for NFTs. So it's the, it's the audio focused, the music focused NFT platform that's slowly rolling out. Um, so on those platforms, you know, they kind of, kind of house the music content a lot better than these other platforms, which are more kind of made to for um, pictures and videos. So you could still like, let's say make you put up your music video or just create a visual that goes along with your song and it's an MP4 file and it goes up on, let's say, OpenSea. 
but now some of these are starting to allow just WAV files or MP3s to exist. And Catalog is really trying to build the user facing site that, that just feels more like a bank camp or Spotify where the cover artwork's there, the metadata is there. You're able to navigate around the site while the music is still playing, things like that that make it a kind of music focused um, site. So I would, I would say that, that, one, that is one to definitely watch. That's very interesting. I, I've read a little bit of stuff in the visual art world where they'll have the original auction for it and the artist will receive, you know, the the whatever it's, it's auctioned for. But they'll also somehow encode in that token that they are owed some percentage of whatever this thing sells for in the future. Is, is that a thing that will um, can you kind of describe how that works and whether that will be a part yeah. of the music uh, aspect of it? For sure. So that's actually like a really big part, a really huge, um, not even bonus. This is like kind of the central, one of the central kind of value props of, of this new world. Besides just being able to um, wrap kind of uh, or carve value out of, out of digital content that we couldn't before, we can now also, like I said, trace that content, how it moves around um, the blockchain in its entirety kind of forever in perpetuity. And with that, there are now standards to be able to create a creator fee, what's called a creator fee or, or an artist fee. So when you would actually create the, the NFT, the original file, you drag and drop your wave on there, you put all the information, you would also add a percentage that every time that song, that song or that file is sold on the secondary market after you originally auction it off, you will get that percentage off every secondary market sale. So what that does is it actually tracks your value over time rather than just, let's say you today are kind of just getting started and you sell your pieces for a very small amount. But then in a few years, you start to really take off and then your stuff has gained value, but it's up until now, it's always the people who, have, who kind of bet on you early on who definitely d deserve to, to win off that too. But you kind of lose out on being able to um, uh, kind of, you know, uh, capture that value. So now you could actually track your value and capture your value as it grows over time and receive 10%, 20%, whatever you decide to be the number um, in perpetuity off that, off that content. You had a beautiful line in one of your articles that I thought got to the heart of this in, in just one sentence, which you basically said that this is the first time that we figured out, you know, in internet 2.0 or 3.0, wherever we're at, this is the first time that we've been able to monetize going viral. Correct. Yeah, exactly. At least for I the mean, artist. Right? I mean, it seems like for the platforms, they could monetize it, but the artist couldn't monetize it. Well, that's it. That's it. You know, and I wrote in a, 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 a more recent article that like tokenizing your files or tokenizing your community is, is another aspect of it. That, that takes this conversation further, it's not new, you know, like the platforms that our content lives on, they've already tokenized our content, meaning they have, you know, they are tracking and capturing the value of the content through creating these ties between us and our viewers and, and, and owning all of that data and, and it doesn't feed back to us. So our content is already tokenized, but it's just tokenized in these central worlds of Spotify, Instagram, YouTube, whatsoever, we are now just bringing the value back to the rightful owner. It's, we're not creating uh, artificial value. We're, we're just like reorienting it to the original owner. Can you talk to me a little bit about, I've, I've noticed that there has been um, some ability to attach uh, publishing rights. And for people who are listeners that don't know what publishing is, publishing is basically what intellectual property is called in the music business. If you're a songwriter and you wrote a song and you own that intellectual property, it's called publishing. And I seem to remember reading in one of your articles that uh, there's now some ability to attach either like the entire publishing for a song to an NFT so you could auction off um, the intellectual property to it or to even split it up. So if you have a band and the singer owns 25% of the publishing and the guitar player owns 25 Five percent, and so on and so forth, that could be encoded straight into the NFT. Can you talk about um, the world of publishing and how it relates to NFTs? 
Yeah. So this this whole conversation with uh, you know bringing intellectual property into the mix is a very interesting one, and we're really right at the beginning. I mean, we're at the beginning of all of this, obviously, but right up until now, we're seeing pretty static examples of what NFTs will be. They will be these are smart contracts. That's what they're called, and they will be a lot smarter as time goes on. Meaning, we'll be able to, like you said, programmatically split up um, IP, split up the publishing rights between the collaborators and, and creators of the song. And all of that just lives on chain, meaning all that lives on the blockchain and the flow of rights and royalties will just automatically flow into your digital wallets um, without any intermediaries or kind of like, you know, traditional contracts needed. Um, but we're not necessarily there yet. These things are starting to pop up here and there, but that's like the matured environment we're heading towards. Right now, I think the instance that you're referring to in my article was one where an artist by the name of Jacques Green posted a six-second audiovisual loop of his song that was unreleased on one of the platforms I mentioned called Foundation. And he auctioned that off. And in the description of the auction page, he put this NFT also comes with a promise of 100% of the publishing rights. Mm. So that's an example of you know, an off-chain agreement. So, so once the purchaser, you know, wins that auction, they'll actually have to get in touch and, you know, sort of create an agreement to, to transfer over those rights and to also send those royalties over through the organizations we have to collect and... Through like BMI, or they would then register it with a, just yeah. a regular PRO. Exactly. But, and, and of course, these are organizations like you're mentioning that are cemented in the music industry for, for, for like a century, for a long time. So it's going to take time for us to navigate and, and, and understand how all this new world stuff is going to fit into play. I mean, I'm an idealist. I like to think of it that eventually, you know, my song will be streaming in some, you know, home in us in Australia. And as that song is streaming every single contributor and rights holder of that song on either the master or publishing side, they are being streamed their share of the royalties into mm -hmm. their digital wallets in real time. That is the future I see. It's going to take some, some, some real time to get there. Yeah. But I mean, that's, I mean, you know, in 10 years, we'll probably be there, man. I mean, this stuff has been moving so fast. I mean, we weren't even streaming music 10 years ago, you know, that's very true. And, and, and as you dive into this world, it's it's funny like the more you dive in the more you find that the current state of things feels broken uh you know w when we talked about kind of like the the intermediary platforms siphoning up a lot of the value of of, of digital content of today to the, the the pros where then you start to think like man i just go on this site and i type in the metadata of my song and then some human on the other end needs to go find that song everywhere that it exists, it, it just seems really archaic really quickly. I've read a little bit about how tokens in a similar way can be used for artists to use as a, basically fan club subscriptions. So in, a fan mm -hmm. would, would buy a token and then that token would allow them to have some sort of access cross-platform wise uh, to the artist's whole world. Can you describe the vision for how that process is going to work? Yeah. So what you're referring to there are like often referred to as social tokens. So just like there's Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these other uh, cryptocurrencies or tokens, we can also have artist created tokens. So let's say I created my own token and let's say I called it dollar sign Matthew. Mm -hmm. um, that would be the token referring to like, let's say my community. And I would distribute that maybe amongst my super fans. Mm -hmm. And I would say holding this token gets you access into things. Um, what this does is because that, that token, like we've spoken about in terms of the blockchain and this distributed ledger, that token doesn't exist on one website. Like it's the token for my community on Facebook or on, right. or on YouTube or on Twitch. It, it transcends the websites. So that's a way, it, it's an incredible way to now tether together your community without relying on any one website and suddenly your community has this kind of almost this power where you could just move around and you use platforms in very different ways that way. So you can 
for instance, gate certain content. So you say, okay, you'll only get this content if you hold so and so much of dollar sign Matthew. You can also, because it's all um, publicly verifiable, you'll know all, you could see all the digital wallets that hold your tokens and you could actually airdrop them, let's say more tokens or NFTs that you drop um, of your, your artwork and such. So there are many ways this is going to proliferate. These are just a few of the examples of um, these tokenized communities that are, that are already off the ground and they're just starting to, to get running. But, but this is where I see things really going. You know, it's, it's not so much about selling your NFTs and then just making a quick buck. Um, selling an NFT is actually like quite a strong bond form, formed formation with your fan. And we can see that that will start to move into, you know, it doesn't just need to be a fungible token like dollar sign Matthew to get into my tokenized community. Maybe every one of my NFTs acts as a quote unquote access card into my um, gated community. So these things like really allow a brand new canvas for um, artists to be really creative about how they want to build their communities and how they want to move content and you know, relationships around in that, in that community. And it, it just, it, the, the imagination is, it becomes the limit. But if I wanted to use that sort of crypto token for um, fans to be platformless with me and kind of visit those platforms, like for me, I have a, I have a podcast and then I have music on Spotify and then I have a streaming show on YouTube. So if I wanted people to be able to access all three of those things, wouldn't I then be reliant on the Apple podcast store to take those tokens to gate it, Spotify to take those tokens to gate it for me and YouTube to take those tokens? Well, yeah, I mean, if you're sending that content to those platforms, mm -hmm. and yeah, um, you wouldn't necessarily be able to do it, at least today, because those, you know, those platforms are closed. Um, mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not open for you to be able to kind of add your own Lego blocks to the thing. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing happen in this, what we call kind of the Web3 world, um, or, this, or this crypto blockchain world, is the applications that are being built today are much like the blockchain are kind of open and allow for more, they more, they don't create these closed platforms, but they kind of create these open platforms that are more like Lego blocks for you to build it however you want. So we could see the platforms of tomorrow, the Spotify's of tomorrow, or maybe this stuff takes off so much that Spotify's and, and the, the Apple music's need to like get to the point where they have to start complying with and, and, and playing ball with some of this new stuff. But we're going to see, whether it's them or other platforms kind of open the doors up and say, build however you want, you know, and if you want to make certain content available, if you, you know, to anyone and then other content only available to people who hold, you know, 16 Joe tokens or, or 16,000 Joe tokens or whatever mm -hmm. you decide, um, you'll be able to do that. So the only thing that makes me feel um, not bullish on this and almost makes me feel like it's a bubble is the idea there would have to be some great simplification for listeners um, to make all this happen because most people are just the people. The reason people like Spotify is they're like, I don't know, man, I pay 10 bucks a month and then I press a button and all these songs are there. You know what I mean? Like, so totally. th that seems to me like a really hard product to beat, especially if it's kind of confusing. Like, yeah, I, I like Matthew James music, but what I'm going to go in and put in all my information in my bank card you know, just to get these couple songs from him? Like, how do you think that this right. could simplify in a way that makes it as mm -hmm. user-friendly for people and as frictionless as Spotify is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. And there's my, my mind starts to go to a lot of answers because, again, it's like a very early space and there will probably be 167,000 attempts at, 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 at solving for that problem, right? Mm -hmm. Um but, but the things that come to mind off the bat are there's always going to be a market for, you know, this sort of $10 all-you-can-eat buffet of music right. or whatever content that is, or maybe even free. Like you go to YouTube and people are willing to sit through ads to get all of that content for free. Right. Um, but people are also craving more active experiences online. And I would, you know, as I would argue it from even my own experience – as a listener, um, Spotify is great for obviously, you know, taking in 
all sorts of music, going to find whatever music I want. But I'm, I tend to use Spotify more as a passive listener. I, I use it while I work. I listen to like jazz or solo piano music. But for the artists that I love, I'm craving more intimacy, more active participation in their community and their world. And if these things allow me access to that, um, then I, 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 I'm down to put in that effort. And obviously I've definitely jumped down this rabbit hole. So I'm willing to play with some of the clinky, uh, sorry, clunky machines of today, but the products are getting better and they're just going to get much, much, much better, easier to use and more fun to use that I think that will open up for many, many more people who have the same desire to have active, you know, relationships the same way when you would go to the vinyl shop and be able to scan through vinyls and, and read liner notes and, and have more um, kind of depth into the, into the projects. Um, that's what, we're, what people are craving. And I think the products are going to surface to allow those to happen quite easy, but yeah, the, the people are going to be, you know, putting in more than I guess $10 a month to be a part of those things. I think the other answer that, that goes to this stuff is like where the stuff gets real crazy is um, the relationship between artist and fan starts to blur because as we were talking about these ideas of starting to be able to fractionalize and sell different rights of your music and all these things and build communities around your coin or your non fungible tokens. I think we're going to start to see, you know, the, the dissolving away of some label kind of structures of today into more like my community. If I'm an artist, my community will own a part of my music and they help build my community because they're active participants in the community and they benefit off the, the, like you said, the virality of if I'm, you know, as I grow and my, my cultural value grows, they actually benefit, benefit off that from, from a true monetarily, um, monetary standpoint. So for those reasons and more, um, I think these things will just get more and more user friendly and exciting. That's all brilliant. You're, you're brilliant at explaining it. Matthew Chain, where can people go to find your music? And if they were going to listen to what one song of yours to, to get started, what, what do you think the gateway drug is for your music? Hmm. Such a good question. How can how can I say Spotify now after everything <laughs> no. you just said? Um, no, but you could you could find my my music on any of the platforms you enjoy using. Um, you could also check it out on Catalog.works because I've started to toy around there, and I've also started to play on Audius, uh, A U D I U S, which is also um, trying to be kind of this Web three uh, streaming platform and take on those big guys. So yeah, but all that to say, you could find me kind of on any of those websites and if you were to take in one song i would point you towards homemade um homemade. one of my one of my more original songs and it it also talks about kind of being this uh uh diy kind of creator and making you know it really being about the art so i think it's kind of fitting for um the stuff we're talking about brilliant thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it thank you joe This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Matthew Chain's articles on NFTs and Web 3.0 for music can be found at 137pm.com. That's O-N-E 37pm.com. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So, let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song. <laughs>